Good evening. Welcome to another night of Friends and Fiction Official Book Club. I'm Brenda Gardner from South Carolina, and with me is my lovely co host, Lisa. Hi. Welcome, Lisa. Hello. And we have the honor of having Patty Callahan Henry with us this evening to talk about Once Upon a Wardrobe. And we are so excited to have you here, Patty. I am so happy to be here. We've been talking about this for months. And when, when we posted the other day, I was like, it's Monday. It's Monday. <laughs> like we get to do this finally. I've been excited about it because every time we talked about it, we've had to kind of skirt around it. And now we get to really talk about it. So I know it's actually here. And I know you've talked about once upon a wardrobe a lot, but um, hopefully we have some kind of new avenues to go down tonight. And I know the readers have just really, really enjoyed it. There's some just amazing comments in the, on the book club page, awesome. some of which we'll talk about tonight. So we're just really happy to have you here, Patty. And Lisa's going to kick us off. Oh, no, she's not because I'm supposed to do something first. <laughs> okay. What are we doing? Are we having a party? No, I'm sorry. Oh. We're, <laughs> Cheers we're just to you, Patty. You. Well, we are having a party, wow. but it's after I formally uh, introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, before you formally introduce me, yes. doesn't it feel like it's 10 o'clock at night? It does. It has been dark for two hours. Forever. <laughs> it does I, feel really late. I cannot get used to the time change. I'm starving at 1130 in the morning. I know. You know, for, for lunch. It's and it's nice. cold. It's cold. In Atlanta, uh, it's cold, like. I don't like it. In Birmingham at like 4.30 in the afternoon. I know. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. All right. I'll be quiet. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> we'll have the party after I do the four <laughs> introduction. There you go. All right. So we're discussing Patty Callahan Henry's work today, and she is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of 16 novels and a podcast host. She's a recipient of the Christie Award, 19, uh, excuse me, 2019 Winner Book of the Year, the Harper Lee Distinguished Writer of the Year for 2020, and the Alabama Library Association Book of the Year for 2019. She's the co-host and co-creator of the popular weekly online Friends and Fiction live web show. Hmm, I wonder what that is. <laughs> Never heard of that one. I've heard it's really what? good, really good stuff. <laughs> I heard Patty. they have some really great hosts on that. I know, right? Check it out. Yeah. Patty's also a contributor to the weekly <laughs> life lesson essay column for Parade Magazine. A full-time author and mother of three, she now resides in both Mountain Brook, Alabama and Bluffton, South Carolina with her husband. Welcome, Patty. Now the party begins. Now the party Ooh. party. It's always so <laughs> strange to hear your bio read when you're sitting there. So, you know. Lisa do you not Gardner. quite know what to do? <laughs> yeah. Away, should I smile? All right, let's talk, ladies. Okay. Now, Before we dive to... into the book, <laughs> I have one question that I am dying to. Well, first, I want to congratulate you on all the buzz that Once Upon a Wardrobe has received lately. It's so well-deserved. It's something that me and Brenda have known all along, and we're so glad. But everyone else caught up. But how how did you feel or where were you when you found out it was gonna be featured on the Today Show and then also pick for Emily Gibson's book club? Well, those came in like a one, two, um, not punch, but one, two, you know, yay. Yeah. Yeah. I was I had just left Atlanta where I was at the Atlanta History Center where I did an in conversation with Emily and I got home the next morning. And well, when I was with her, she said, I think Harlan might suggest your book on Monday. I was like, don't tell me that. Just tell me if you will, <laughs> or if you won't. but don't say he might because I won't be able to stop thinking about it. And um, then honest to God, I just forgot about it because those things sometimes happen and they sometimes don't. And you can't, you know, you can't get all waiting for it. And, um, 
And then Friday afternoon, my publishing house said, can you jump on a quick Zoom? And I was like, oh God, I'm in trouble. What did I do? <laughs> and so I was like, okay, you know, this is end of week two. You know, I've been on, done 22 events in 12 days. And so I jump on this Zoom and they're all, we're going to be on the Today Show. So <laughs> I was really excited. Um and then it, it was like within the same day or two that Emily said, I, I love this book so much. I want to choose it for my November book club. And I was just so grateful because we've been friends a long while, but she doesn't choose books because you're her friends, you know, right. She chooses books because she's running a really amazing book club. And if you look at the books she's chosen before, they are incredible. So I am really honored so that will be the 29th that we'll be talking and our book first books came out um the same month the same year we have oh, the oh. same birthday we share a birthday and our sons have the same for we one of her sons and my son has the same name so there's lots of lots of little connection points so it should be an interesting conversation but to see Harlan Coben stand up on the Today Show and hold up your book and say, you know, call it magical, it's a it's a bit surreal for sure. It was really fun though. I bet it awesome. is. The funny thing is, even I was like, you know, oh, that's Patty's book. <laughs> I know. I felt like a proud parent. Like I had like, some oh, really? Yay. Yay. <laughs> I watched it like five times. But <laughs> so did I. My a really dear friend of mine said she was in the dentist chair and she was going, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? That's a great yeah. Yeah. And well, I we're just so happy because, for you. I didn't tell anybody because sometimes it doesn't happen. Like it gets cut yeah. or something oh. happens or there's breaking news. So you don't want to get all excited and tell everybody. And then, right. Wah, wah. I totally understand. <laughs> I have but it was such a nice before. segment, you know, on the Today he Show. He really talked about it. Like he took a long time to talk about it. It was, mm -hmm. it was wonderful. I um, emailed him through his publicist and said, thank you. And he was like, no, I loved it. It was so enchanting. I was like, all right, that's awesome. Yay. Well, that just Yay. makes me more excited to kind of launch into things tonight. Um, I, I want to ask you for a summary uh, in a moment for those who haven't read the book yet, but I kind of wanted to kick things off because one of our readers posted something that I just thought was a, a great, I usually like to sort of pontificate about the book a little bit, but I just thought this was a great encapsulation of the book and I wanted to read it to you, Patty. All right. Um, and it's from Leslie Bodeman and she posted on Friends and Fiction, just finished this beautiful, heart-wrenching book. Patty Callahan Henry hit it out of the park. Aww. So many pages marked with quotes and so many pages now have tear stains as I cried reading this book. This is definitely going to be a book I come back to again and again. A classic in the making as its message is timeless. Oh, wow. That's a good way to start. Yeah, I just thought that was a perfect Wow. Summary of the impact. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing those. Yes. Words. Thank you so much, Leslie, for sharing because that was just a perfect way to describe this book. It was it was breathtaking. It it really was. Mm -hmm. And the y'all are the, so sweet. Thank you. Back and forth between the timelines and the seamless like storytelling between them. Oh. <laughs> You're yeah. so sweet. Thank you so much. It's um, we sit alone in a room and make up these stories and pour our heart and soul into them. And then when somebody comments on it like that, you just, it's, mm. it's everything. It makes you go back to the work the next day, right? Oh. That, that what you did could have, could have touched someone that way. So thank you. Oh, well, it, it totally has. And we probably yeah. do have a few people watching who may not have read the book yet. So we'd like to ask you if you could give us a little summary and then we'll kick off from there. Okay. The year is 1950. It is winter. There is a little boy named George Devonshire. He is eight years old. 
and he lives in a stone cottage in England with his mom and his dad and his big sister, Megs. He is ill and he is obsessed with a new book that burst onto the scene exactly 71 years ago this winter. A thin volume of a book called The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. He reads it back to front and front to back. He tries to pop the back out of his wardrobe to see if he can enter the magical land of Narnia. His older sister, Megs, is a math and physics genius. She is a student at Oxford University. She's 17. And she believes the world is formed on, founded by, and upheld by fat physics and equations. So she comes home one weekend, and George tells her about this book. And she says, that's so nice that you like that little children's book. So nice. And he says, no, I need you to track down the author who teaches at your university and ask him, where did Narnia come from? Where do magical lands come from? Where do stories come from? She says, that's ridiculous and absurd. And the world is founded on math and physics. And I'm not going to ask this very important man this very silly question. But the book would end there. She didn't do it. So she loves her brother. And she went to ask Lewis, where did this magical land come from? And he doesn't answer her the way I wanted or the way she wanted. And George and Meg set off on adventures. And that's what it's Love about. It. And that is just the beginning. <laughs> I was going to say, and that is all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, we have a lot of love in the chat. Um, I definitely think you'll want to go back and read some of these. Um, a few I want to share really quickly. Mary says, I hugged the book when I finished it. Susie Aww. said, it totally took my breath away. And Brenda says, shout out to Fiona Hardingham, the narrator on the audiobook. Oh my gosh. I totally want to also do that. I did, I read it and I did both. I did a mixture of both. Okay. And I wanted to ask you, her voice was just amazing. Did you pick her or how did that, process work did you were you in the process for selecting the narrator so or were you just have, blessed with the perfect person <laughs> yes but I so I have what's because I don't know how to find the narrators there you know it's changed so much through the years y'all know that there were there used to be like audiobook narrators and that's what they did and that's all they did and now they have so many actors and actresses narrating books and Fiona Hardingham is an actress who also um, narrates books. And, you know, like My Wild Swan that came out last December is narrated by Cynthia Arrivo, who now, did you see, y'all? did y'all see she's got cast in Wicked in the movie Wicked? Yeah. And yet she read my she amazing. novella. She's yeah. amazing. So it's phenomenal. Um, oh and you're God. reading your novella. I mean, I loved it. She isn't phenomenal. So my editor and publisher came to me and said, you have to decide quickly because we have a window of time. Fiona Hardingham is free and we want to hire her. So go listen. And she's done a bunch of Jojo Moyes books. She's done some really beautiful work. And I only had to listen to her for about two minutes when I said, ding, <laughs> I approve. <laughs> yeah, she's beautiful. Her voice is absolutely beautiful. I'm very lucky. She was great. Yeah. Um, and I kind of like, it almost is weird that she, I, that's how I would imagine Meg's would sound. Yeah. Right. Kind um, of, yeah. And perfect. And speaking about, speaking of Meg's, I, there was a question I wanted to ask you, you know, and, and our readers really, because in the beginning, you know, we know that she doesn't she's so mathematical and logical she doesn't really know what to think about she's kind of befuddled by c.s lewis and his stories and, and trying to find those relationships i'm wondering um how you made her change and for our readers what stories have changed your life in that way if you wouldn't mind sharing oh no i, I mean 
I'll start with my character before I talk about myself, but I, you know, as we all know, and Brenda and Lisa, you've heard us talk a thousand times, whether it's writing tips from other authors or us talking about our stories, no story is worth its salt if the character doesn't change. That's what story is. A character transforms from here to there. That's what story is about. It's about a character who goes through something and wants something and changes because of it. So of course, Megs has to transform and she has to shift in some ways. And so for me, when I was about halfway through the book, which is usually about the point where one of two things happen, I despair that I'm never going to finish it and that it stinks to high heavens and that I have a better idea that's all shiny and bright over here or, and I try to quit and my friends don't let me, friends don't let friends quit books. And then, or I am halfway through and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to see it. And when I was about halfway through this book, and we've talked about this before, but I wrote this book during the lockdown. I wrote this book during the pandemic. I, I often describe this book as my still point in a madly burning world. And so in about halfway through, I noticed and knew, understood that Meg represented logic and George represented imagination and myth. And that they were both in many ways planting their flags in those two camps. And both of them needed to see the other side. I mean, Meg's, when she gets a story from Lewis, she reads it to George and we see it through George's eyes. We see it through the innocence and liminal space of this eight-year-old. And yet she's trying to make diagrams and connections and he's seeing it as a, he's imagining himself in an attic or imagining himself at Dunluce Castle. And she's making a chart. The lion came from here. The witch came from here. I can, you know, and so, yeah. So I knew that her logic and his imagination had to meet in the middle. And that is where Patrick came in, the character that you meet about halfway through the book. Because whenever we have two opposing forces, the thing that usually brings them together is a third thing. And that is who he is. And he is the one that starts to take them on adventures as they both come to awareness that their camps can't, you can't live, you can't live just here and just here. You have to meld them. But as far as me and what books have influenced my life, they, it, it, it's hard to answer that. Um, I'd like to flip it onto you guys because you too, because, and, and to our readers, because I think there it's, it's a stepping stone of books that influence us. Right. So as a, as a child, I was obsessed with Charlotte's web. Right. And then as a, as a little bit older, I wanted to be Laura Ingalls Wilder. I, I would have been miserable. I would have, I, I would have had a terrible life, but I thought I wanted to be Laura Ingalls Wilder, right? Then I wanted to be Nancy Drew. And then, you know, then I wanted to be Lucy Pevensey in, in Narnia. So there are these moments in my life where books have been, and I know it's the same for both of you, where books have been stepping stones to the next and the next, and they've nurtured my life. They've helped me make sense out of life. Um, but as far as which ones have changed me, it, there's a whole litany of, and there still are. I mean, I just finished that book, Circe. I know I'm late to the party that came out a couple of years ago and everybody's <laughs> talking about it, but dang y'all, it's based on the myth of, you know, Circe, who many people think the white witch is fashioned after because Circe was a goddess who turned into a witch, but um, the, the stories are all connected. Everything's connected, so. I know it. It really does seem that way because in your in your book too, so many of the, even though you can't really go A equals B, there are so many things that are interconnected. And yeah. I don't want to go to spoilers because we didn't issue our spoiler alert that we would do. We have before. about ten minutes so we can after seven thirty. So I'll wait on that. But there are so many things that are interconnected in the book, and I'm I'm kind of curious if our readers put it in the chat what what things they were fascinated by. Yeah. Uh, but I know Lisa has some questions from the chat that she wants to um, to pose I to you. I do. I have one here from Melissa. 
She says, I totally love the quote, you must be very careful about what you choose to read. Unless you want to stay stuck in your opinions and hard boiled thoughts, you must be very careful. Was that an actual quote or did you come up with that? That is a C.S. Lewis quote with a little bit of, of my sugar on it. So, <laughs> um, you know, I had to get permission, of course, for every direct quote that I give of his. But the word hard boiled, that is his. Um, but otherwise, I, I, I would take these direct quotes and I didn't want to just like plug them into the story. You, you'd be able to tell. Right. I needed them to be conversational, but it's one of his most famous quotes. And one of the things I wanted Megs to understand was that and, and I want everyone to understand. And we have to remember that, especially these days, y'all, we, we stand on either side of this abyss between us all and get stuck in our hard boiled opinions. And how are we to ever shift and see someone else's point of view if we're not reading? Um and finding some empathy. And I think what Lewis was trying to say is if you're only reading this or only reading that and you're only um, affirming what you think you already know, um, right. be careful, be very careful what you read. And that's so important and relevant right now with what's yep. going on just in our, in our country and in our world, you know, people seem to, you know, my mom always told me to become friends with everyone, people that don't look like you, have discussions with people that think differently than you, you know, respect each other for your differences. And it's the best way to grow. And that's what makes us unique. If we all thought the same and read the same and did the same thing, life boring. would be so boring. Yeah. And I think that's a lesson that needs to be taught today to the current and I, and I think a lot about I wonder what he would say about where we are today right I mean even mm -hmm. that quote about being careful what you read if you read the same thing over and over the same Facebook post the same article right <laughs> newspaper right and you don't switch I mean it's scientifically proven that reading fiction makes you a more empathetic person because you see through others' eyes, you feel others' experiences, you see through other worlds, you travel to other places, you see what's important oh, to true. people who are different than you. And so mm -hmm. be careful what you read. Yeah, oh, I love that. I love that. Well, I'd like to just, Lisa, if you have another question, we'll jump right to it. But I did want to touch on George briefly before we go any farther, because we talked about Meg's and George is her adored, adored little brother. And he has a different out, such a different outlook than she has. Yeah. And, and he's so bent on this question, you know, this sort of pure question, like yep. where did Narnia come from? And so I, this is a question for the readers too, is where do, what do you think that George was really asking and where were you going with George's um, sort of trajectory? That is such a good question. And believe it or not, after 26 events, nobody has asked. <laughs> so that is Yay. a really good question because, um, you know, what he's really asking is, is there something more? is there only what we can see is that all there is is only what we can see or is there something more um is there only the seen or is there an unseen right here in the same world with us I let the people are starting to there's a slight delay so they're starting to answer that in the chat but there were a few answers to the previous question about books that changed changed you and Debbie says the secret garden was a game changer for oh her. yeah yep uh Barbara said Charlotte's Web was her favorite book from childhood yeah it was the first one she really remembers impacting her if you Lisa don't cry says the little house Web. book yeah oh, no. what Patty I'm sorry if you don't cry at Charlotte's Web you have no heart oh I know um 
there was one, and I'm sorry, it went by. Oh, here we go. Carrie said, "Becoming Mrs. Lewis changed me," and oh. so did wardrobe. Yeah. Dang, that's amazing. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, Lori said she wanted to be Laura Ingalls as well. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. And I, I'll, well, I'll, um, I'll uh, second the Secret Garden one because I talked about this a little bit. Um, I can't remember which episode it was that y'all were talking about it, but that I, I just... I had empathy for George in this book the way I did for Colin in The Secret Garden. It was just such an epic book for me when I was young. I'm not sure really why. I think because there was sort of this loneliness about it that I was feeling at the time. And it just really spoke to me, just as this one did. And the loneliness of that little boy in that book, looking out the window at that garden, like that garden represented so much longing, right? Longing for, same with George, longing for something more, something something more than what he could see. Oh, I love that book. Anissa said, George knows his destiny and is looking for what he will be seeing next. That's exactly right. Anissa knows, she always knows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well said, Anissa. Yes. <laughs> yep. Now, if I could ask, this is one of the advanced questions, but it pertains to George in the way that you approached him um, in, in your writing. And, and I apologize if I've got the name wrong, but it's Edie Bartness Cohen wants to know, <clears throat> while it was familiar to write about Mr. Lewis for you, was it hard to get inside of a, a, a young child who's sick and sweet like George's character? Um, no, that's what was so surprising. Um, he came, he's the one character in the book, except for Lewis and Warney, except for Jack and Warney, who I, you know, I have my own little relationship with, right? Um, <laughs> George, George came to me, that little boy, um, completely whole and innocent. And Lewis has this great quote when he was asked about how he knew how to write about children so well. And he said, you know, there's always a child inside of me, whether, I mean, we can say us, there's always a child inside of us. There's always the eight-year-old, the 12-year-old, the 15-year-old, you know, we get older, but we don't lose those pieces of ourselves. They might slip into the subconscious or we don't pay attention or we don't listen, but they don't disappear. Um, and I, I think because I was an avid bookworm nerd reader when I was a child and it did sustain me and I was you know I escaped into books and and wild away my afternoons with books that I could bring up that kind of innocent belief that I too would find the door to Narnia that I could wander through the woodlands and I would see something and I'd be able to sneak through and and see what I couldn't see. And it, it wasn't that difficult for me to tap into that memory. Um, I think it would be harder for me to write from like a 16 or 17 year old's point of view. Um, yeah. I, I have more trouble tapping into those years than I <laughs> innocent. Uh, George just came. Yeah, I don't want to write about those years. George. <laughs> George just came to me that way. I mean, the opening line never changed, which is very unusual. Usually the opening chapter and the opening lines always change. Um, but it that the opening line stayed the opening line from the day I started that book. Wow, that's really interesting. And I'm gonna have to go after this and think about that, think about what you said, because that's so, I don't know, just such a perfect, like, summary in that the young people do not leave us they just go farther into our yeah. you know subconscious and they come out and I'm like oh wow yep. my mind <laughs> yep yeah. like, there, what's, what's all you know I think I wish I had a photographic memory because I mean this quote is essentially that you know he could tap in he could be 50 years old and be 12 years old but 25 
but 32, but you know, you could be all the ages that you've <laughs> ever been. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a comment and one more quick question that's not a spoiler, but I'm gonna give the warning because after this question, it will switch to spoilers. But the comment is from our wonderful and lovely moderator, Jodena, that we love so much. Hi, Jodena. She says, I needed wardrobe at this time in my life. The quotes are amazing, Patty. Thank you. Thank you. I needed it too. So maybe I that's how we all works. did. <laughs> I think that's how it works, right? Um, that when we write what we need, maybe somebody else needs it too. So thank you. Yeah, we all needed it, I think. Um, Sharon has a question and she says, this book was so beautifully written. Have you ever thought about writing a YA or children's book? Speaking of 16 or 17. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, wow. You know, I haven't. I mean, I, of course I have. I mean, every book crosses our mind. Should I write YA? Should I write a picture book? Should I write, I mean, <laughs> we're authors. We're like, bing, 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 bing. Cookbook. <laughs> yeah, should I write a cookbook? If my mom is here, she's shaking her head. She should not write a cookbook. Absolutely, <laughs> Patty should not write a cookbook. Unless it's like how to bake cookies because I love baking. Like, have you guys watched the British Bake Off? Yes. Oh my gosh. It's a guilty pleasure. Oh my gosh. So I love baking. I don't like cooking. I do cook. I just don't like it. But that's a tangent. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I, ha I have no opposition to writing a YA or a children's book. If the idea came to me, it, it's the same as um, people say, why did you start writing historical? I didn't mean to start writing historical. Those were the stories that started pinging my interest. Those were the stories that I became curious about. Those were the stories that were bubbling up. I can't write what I'm not curious about. I mean, I can. I would prefer not to write what I'm not curious about. And but so, you, every, oh, no, no, what were you saying? I was just going to say, but you have to be interested because you're spending so much time with the characters. And not only that, once you've even finished all of that process, then you go on book tour and you're talking about it for. <laughs> so you're living with the story for years. I mean, especially these more intent, you know, research intense stories you know, a couple of years of research, then there's the writing, then the editing, then the touring, then the talking. If, if I'm not curious about it and don't care about it, what drudgery is that? I don't want to do that. But um, if I had a great YA idea, I would love to write it. I think it would be great fun. Um, that just hasn't happened yet. Another good scoop for our book club. <laughs> for our book club. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was spoiler time. We're going to do the yes. spoiler alert now. So thank you, Lisa. I you was know. behind schedule and getting to that. Well, I'm going to kind of start in midstream because we talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to get into a little bit more because Anissa asked this very interesting question in advance, um, and it's kind of a spoiler. So we'll we'll ease into the spoilers. But <laughs> was curious about how the scene happened where Megs goes to C.S. Lewis's house for the first time at the kilns and she's hiding out and Warney finds her yeah how did that how did that come about and she didn't just go there once she was snooping around for a few times <laughs> yeah um you know uh, you know to say where something came from so it's a kind of a meta question like how do I talk about where my story comes from in a book that's about where does the story come from, right? Like there's, there's yeah. these, I know, right? But there's, there's, there's great mystery in, in answering those kinds of things because I might be able to say, and I can say, well, I knew the next scene was that she would have to find him. Where should she find him? Should she track him down in, um, at, a, at a lecture? Well, she's too shy. Would she try to talk to him in the bird and baby? No, she's probably not going to be in a pub. Would she go to his rooms? She can't. It's an all boys college that he teaches at. And she goes to Somerville, which is one of the only um, women's colleges at 
Oxford University in the year of 1950. So as I started to wonder where would she go, where would she ask him, um, I wanted her, I decided I wanted her, her to ask him in, in a place that kind of echoed of Narnia that resonated as Narnia, that maybe she, her barriers would be broken down a little bit. But other than that, it was just how it happened. I, I had her in the backyard watching them and I realized this was not the first time she'd done it and that she was hiding back there. And then I didn't, I wanted Warney to find her. But those are the kind of things that just happen as you're writing. Um, it's very inexplicable and Part of me doesn't want to figure it out because I'm afraid if I figure it out, it'll stop happening because that is what we write for when we're as writers. It's what we live for. It's the moment where a scene comes so alive that we aren't as much writing it as we're typing it. Right. It's 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 I'm, I'm watching her in the woods looking around and then all of a sudden Warney's there and I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I wonder what happens next, you know? <laughs> I love that. You're just, you're just capturing the story. Yeah, and it doesn't always happen that way. And I think that was one of the scenes that did. And when it does happen, we, what, we go back the next morning hoping it'll happen again, and then it doesn't. And you're like, damn. Do you have another question, Brenda? I, I do, if you don't have something you wanted to mention from the... Chat. I think you should go because this might be the same question. I think okay. you go. Well, I was wondering about um, for you as a writer, was there a scene in the story that was most powerful to you? And, and in turn to our readers, what, what resonated with you in the book as, as a powerful scene? Oh, so many. Gosh, that's such a hard question. Sorry. You're, you're a <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say that for me, one, there's only one place in the book that we go that I have never been yet. Um, otherwise, you know, the Oxford and everywhere we are in that part of the storyline, I have been, you know, I was there for all my research for becoming Mrs. Lewis. But when they go to Dunluce Castle, on the, you knew it, didn't you? <laughs> It was, um, I'm going and I'm going, I, I hope I'm going this year. I, I, I really, really, really want to go there. But um, there is a scene and, and we're in spoilers. So I don't have to tell you there's a scene, but Jack and Warney's mother takes them to the, on holiday, they don't call it vacation. They call it holiday to the Northern tip of Ireland because they lived in Belfast when they were children. And they went and they saw Dunluce Castle, which is this medieval castle sitting on a cliff overlooking the Irish sea with waves pounding these granite rocks and this old broken down stone castle that looks like it could be in Game of Thrones. And it just, I mean, I've only seen the pictures, I admit, because it's the only place in the book I haven't been. But I talked to a number of people who have been, my friends, the Downings have been there and I talked to her, but um, I got these aerial shots of it and these side shots. And then I, it's one of the rabbit holes I fell down. Then I started reading about the history of that castle. And it was so, I put a couple of the stories in the book, like how the kitchen fell off into the sea. Um, mm -hmm. A little boy went to, to go get some flour or wheat and came back and the kitchen was gone. It had fallen into the ocean. Um, and, but what was fascinating for the book, not only was this a grand adventure that Megs and George go on, that Megs was scared to go on, that Patrick took her on, but it opened her heart. That was the scene where she kind of cracked open a little bit. But was fascinating for me was that any of us as children might have seen that castle. I mean, like, that's really cool. Now can I go to the beach? You know, and, and, and just, it would have been a memory, a memory kind of stuck in our craw or a really cool castle. Um, and yet C.S. Lewis turned that into Care Paravel, the castle where the white witch lives and where Edmund must go and where Tumnus is turned to stone. And 
this man and his imagination could take something that ordinary, a broken down castle that thousands and thousands and thousands of people have seen, and through the alchemy and magic of story, turned it into something extraordinary. And so that scene was not only one of my favorite to write, but was was a scene where my main character, Megs, could, could crack a little bit. Well, I thought that scene was just mythical. It was so, oh, I can't even describe it. I don't have the words. Yeah. But, and I was so tempted before our, our um, session tonight, I was thinking I need to find a photo of Dunlace Castle so it can be my like virtual background for tonight. <laughs> no, I we, we should have thought of that. I could have popped was, up like a screen chair, but everybody out there has Google. Go Google Dunlace <laughs> Castle, D-U-N-L-U-C-E. It is, it's probably the prettiest thing I've, castle I've ever seen. It just sits on this prominent, you know, point overlooking I mean you can imagine it in medieval times you can imagine knights and fair maidens and horses and it's not it's not hard to imagine what might have gone on there well there's an overwhelming response in the chat that the castle scene that is pretty much everyone's favorite the adventure oh. of the castle was my favorite that's um, awesome yeah there's a lot um I do have a question from the chat from Carrie. Okay. Hi, she Carrie. says, and she's specific, so I want to get this right. <laughs> so my question came to me on page 106. Okay. How do you prevent that which is unknowable from overshadowing the belief that there is something more? By the end of the book, George and Jack answered it. So is there a question? The question is, how do you prevent that which is unknowable from overshadowing the belief that there is something more? Got it, got it, got it. Okay, sorry, it like glitched out for a second. Wow, okay. that is a deep question, Carrie. Oh, we're going deeper and yeah. deeper. I was gonna say. <laughs> so there's a great, there's a great quote that Narnian scholars use and they sign their letters this way and they, which is further up and further in. Like you're mm -hmm. always going a little bit deeper. Um, but the how do I let the unknowable not overshadow? Well, that is what the book is in many ways about this this dichotomy between logic and imagination. And I often thought about joy. I mean, I think about joy all the time. Joy Davidman, um, and she has this great quote when she was struggling with that, which is um, that life is too intense to be endured with logic alone. And I really love that. And so Carrie, what I was often trying to do, and I don't think I realized it till later, was live into that statement by Joy Davidman. And then the other one I love that I had on a little slip of paper and always had around when I was writing this book was Lewis's quote that imagination is the organ of meaning. And so we, we have to use our logic to see the castle on the, on the cliff, but yet our imagination is what makes meaning out of things. We are meaning making human beings. We have 86 billion brain cells in here and all of them are trying to make meaning out of the world. They are all trying to control and make meaning out of the world. We are literally wired for story because we are trying to make meaning out of things. And so imagination and story is how we make meaning out of things. And so the unknowable will always be unknowable. And if you're looking for certainty, good luck with that one. So we have to find meaning wherever we can. We have a, another comment in the chat from Mirla. She says, I love the interaction between Megs and her mother, where her mother reaches out her hand to her and there's a beautiful moment between them. And her mother goes back to chopping the carrots and says, because even with the dark parts and the light parts and the good and the bad parts, dinner must still be served. <laughs> that is life. And we have to reach out to each other during those times. Oh, that is, one of my, I'm so, I can't believe she chose that line. You saw my mouth moving. That was one of my favorite lines. When I wrote it, I was like, yeah. damn straight. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, we got to eat. We got it. Well, not only that, but as moms, as wives, as friends, as you know, like these terrible things happen, these good things happen, and we still have to go to the grocery store and pay right. the, bill, the gas in our car and check and see if our tires are tread is low. And, you know, there's, there's certain functions that, that have to happen even in the best of times and even in the worst of times. And, you know, Meg's was, was wondering to herself, how do her mom and dad go through their everyday motions of life, knowing that George is, is so ill. And so that was the mom's answer. That's it. Like, you know, the show must go on. Yep. And also, you know, just the, like, I hate the phrase. I hate it. I hate it. It is what it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I hate it because it's true, but um, I just didn't want anything cliche there. I wanted it to mm -hmm. be about um, how, how her mother was getting through the day. I totally can relate about hating that phrase. And I think it's, it's not necessarily the phrase. It's how some people use it. Yes. It can be true. It is what it is. But when it's used as an excuse yeah. to avoid conversation or detail, then you're just, it's kind of like the eye roll, right? Oh yeah, it is what it is. Oh, okay. Fine. An yeah. You know? not, usually I'm so there with you on that. I'm so oh, <laughs> it's just, when I hear it, I can feel like the nail nails on it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that now I had my tangent. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Brenda, I think you had a question. Oh uh, well, I had a I had a comment from someone watching, and I might have lost it, but I'm going to try to get to it. I do not know how y'all look at the comments and talk to me. I cannot do that. <laughs> Well, I, I am not the best uh, between us at it. I will tell you that. <laughs> I don't even have the face. I don't even have Facebook open. I'm just looking at you two. Like, that's, that's it. I, I did find it. It's Sharon. And she says, and, I, and it's going back a little bit to Meg's, but I just love this because she says, I loved how Meg's became such a great storyteller herself. She started just repeating the story exactly how it was told to her. And gradually that changed and she seemed so excited to tell George what she had learned. And of course he would, this is not her comment anymore, but then of course he was like a sponge. He was yeah. absorbing it all. And it just goes back to what you were saying about story and the importance of story. She, she lived it. And also I wanted to show that she was changing, right? So how do I show you that she's changing without telling you that she's changing? I show you that she's changing by the fact that she is becoming better and better at taking the facts she is given and turning them, turning them into something interesting for George. So I'm glad, Sharon, I'm glad you noticed that. It was, it was one of the very few deliberate um, things that I made when I was doing my edits that I made sure was obvious. Is she getting better at this? How do I show that she's getting better at this? Does George notice she's getting better at this? Does she notice she's getting better at this? And so it was a, it was a deliberate editorial um, change. It, it, and it seemed just masterful too, because it was so natural. Oh, thank you. But um, <clears throat> I did have one other question. I, Lisa may have another one too, but I was curious and I'm not going to be too specific, even though we're allowing spoilers, but this is really spoiler because I'm asking about the end of the story and yeah. how our readers feel about the ending of the story. And Patty, was this the way you initially thought the story would end? Um, yes, on one point and no on another. So <laughs> So I, I mean, I know we're not doing spoilers, but I also don't want to be. So I, no, you, you can do spoilers. We're okay. in our spoilers. So I, knew, I mean, I, I 100% knew. And so do you from page one that George is dying. Right. He said the opening line is George knows. Right. So I'm not, I don't dangle this like Christmas miracle hope. That's not what it's about. It was never what the book was about. Um, and but yet the very last chapter, the epilogue, I didn't see that one coming. 
And that was fun. I didn't see the epilogue coming. Um, but as I was wrapping it up, and, and, and in fact, we even talked about not putting in the epilogue, letting it be extra material or just leaving it where we left it with the lamp post light. But I don't know, we ended up putting it in. So we went round and round, but I love the epilogue. I love seeing what happened to Meg's, what happened to Patrick. What happened that that day that he passed? I, I didn't want to leave it on Christmas Day. Oh, I loved it too. Yeah. It gave us such a sense of sort of hope and renewal that that there was another George. Yes. And you know, his spirit. Oh, I love that. Yeah, his spirit was still there. And that gave wow. it to me, it was just perfect. Perfect ending. <laughs> Lisa, do we have another question or shall I? We want to ask Patty a final question after we do our announcements, but Lisa may have something else from the chat. Right now, everyone is just sharing how much they love the book, the ending. Um, Mary said, the world doesn't stop just for your joy or your pain. No, no. There's so much. I don't see, oh, I do see one question. It's from Anissa. She says, do you have more joy in CS books to write? You have an incredibly deep connection with them. Oh. Mm, thank you, Anissa. I don't know. I would normally say no in a very Mary Kay way. No. <laughs> no. no. And so that means next year we'll be doing the book club. <laughs> right, exactly. So I said no when I finished becoming Mrs. Lewis and then I wrote this, but I know it, I'm not working on anything right now that has anything to do with them. And I know that I don't have any um, curiosity about another facet of their life at the moment, but I also know that I'll always be talking about them and that 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 their story and this story are, are not about the month that the book comes out, but about something that endures. So I'm not worried that because I'm not writing another story about them, like a series that, that, that we're leaving them. But the idea, the book I'm working on now is, has nothing to do with them, but neither did Surviving Savannah. So who knows what will happen next? Oh, can you, you share a little bit about yeah. what you're working on now? I can't. I can't <laughs> because I don't know how to explain it yet. Um, okay. I am at that very squishy, tender part of a new work where explaining it will either destroy it or um, <laughs> sound uninteresting to you. So. Okay, we, we don't want to do. We don't. I want can to tell you it. in England, and I can tell you it's historical. Um, but that's about all I can tell you. Ooh, well, that's a little tease. Yep. That is at least a little, a little nugget. Yep. Yeah. I'm Maybe hoping as the new year rolls around, we can all start talking about, you know, what, what's coming next for everyone. Hopefully, hopefully so. You know, speaking of nuggets, um, Lori Brown mentioned and I noticed this too. She loved that you included the little nugget about Joy Davidman in yeah, me too. Um, in the book, because as I was reading, I was thinking, where is, has he met Joy? I mean, because I couldn't right offhand remember the timeline. I was thinking, where is he in his life? And I was like, oh, there, he, there she yeah, is. They were. <laughs> so she wrote her first letter to him in January of 1950. And this book takes place in October, November, and December of 1950. So they were well into their pen friendship at this time. And um, she did not meet him in person until 1953. Wow. Well, that is awesome. I love that little, little Easter egg in there. Well, yeah. I was like, she's going to haunt me if I don't mention her. <laughs> I loved it. I, I smiled. I was just like, oh, there's joy. A little shout out. There's joy, joy yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. And that Meg's knew about it too. That was, was yeah. really neat. Yeah. Well, I cannot believe the hour is flying by like no it way. has. Oh, I know no. it's four minutes to eight. I cannot believe what? it. What? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we have a few announcements to make and then Patty will um, come back to you with a final question and ask you what you're um, what you're uh, going to be up to in the in the near future. That's so amazing. I wanted to tell our readers, um, besides uh, our special thanks to Patty, but to tune in this Wednesday night on their Friends in Fiction page or the YouTube channel when Friends in Fiction authors welcome Vivian Howard, who is I'm so excited. A TV personality, chef, and restaurateur, and her book is so heavy, I can't read. <laughs> lift it up. But it is a beautiful book. This is the one I have, her earlier book, The Deep Run Roots, and it's just beautiful. And so I'm going to be studying it before Thanksgiving and trying to come up with some things out of that. So we look forward to Wednesday night this week. I am so, I'm hosting and I'm so excited to host her. She's so interesting. I, I can't wait till Wednesday night. It's going to be great. Yes, I can't either. And Ron Block is going to be guest, guest, Ron uh, Block is guest host be because be our Kristen is in Hawaii at her brother's wedding. So, so he's going to be stunt Kristen. Yep. <laughs> and so, we have a special guest in the chat. Christy Woodson Harvey says, hi, Pete. Hi. Chris. Oh, hey, Christy. Christy, what are you doing? Priceless. You have so much to do, Missy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did want to mention too, we the book club has some big events coming up too. This Thursday, we're having our Friendsgiving, Thursday, November 18th, where we get together and share recipes and just generally kind of have a good time and enjoy the holiday before it gets really hectic. And speaking of Ron Block, we have our happy hour coming up on December 1st with him, where he talks about his book recommendations. And then as if that were December, enough, December oh, 3rd, third, I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you. Friday, Lisa. December 3rd. And then speaking of Christy dropping in, we have a double header for holiday books in December that we're reading. We're doing Mary Kate Andrews, The Santa Suit on December 6th and Christy Woodson Harvey's Christmas at Peachtree Bluff on December 20th. That's Yay. awesome. I'll be there. Lisa. Oh, great, great. Yeah. So Lisa, what, did, I, did I miss anything? I just wanted to add, we know that you guys really love our happy hours with Ron Block, so you can have your pens ready to add things to your TBR, but you do not want to miss this one on December 3rd because we will blow up your TBR like we always do, but we will be announcing our January, February, and March book club picks as well as special events that happen in those months. And you guys are going to be very excited. So I already know. Make sure you... It's exciting. Yeah. Patty knows the secret. I <laughs> know all the secrets. And, you know, and plus, you never know what's going to happen during happy hour with Ron Block. It's not no, just me not. and Ron and, and Brenda having cocktails and mocktails. It's awesome. Um, you never know who might pop up. So make sure you. So Patty, we have thoroughly enjoyed having you tonight. Could you, is there, would you like to share anything about some things you have coming up? Oh, y'all, this was so fun. I, I've been looking forward to this through all those events and being able to talk about spoilers and talk to our community everywhere I go. I talk about friends and fiction. But no, I am right now um, getting ready to enjoy the holidays. I leave on Saturday and I get to see the Henry side of the family, which is my husband's brothers and mom. And then my parents are coming over. So, and then my daughter, who you all mostly know, lives in Hawaii and has a new baby and a three-year-old. They are coming home for almost a month. So I will be around, but I will not be bopping from book event to book event. I will be playing Winnie the Pooh and Dinosaur Puzzle and baking. Oh. I know. I will ask you one final question. No, this was asked in advance by Linda Burrell. Was the name Beatrice used as a nod to your Beatrix? Or was this used before you knew she was on the way? Oh, gosh. No, she... Isn't that crazy? So, uh, oh, and that's something else I wanted to say. I know I put it on the page today, but um, you reminded me of it with Beatrix, Beatrix Potter. Um, I did a book club this past week and the woman who was the head of it named Annie Nardoni did 
compiled a list of all the books mentioned and music mentioned in Once Upon a Wardrobe. And I put it on my book club kit and I put it on the Friends in Fiction official book club page. But no, in fact, Beatrix did not, my Beatrix did not have her name until she was a few hours old. Um, and they did that with Bridget too. Bridget went a full day without a proper name. Um, so um, Megan's husband, Evan, thought of it and they called me together and said, what do you think? And I was like, two thumbs up. So, and Beatrix was born on Bridget's birthday. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they have the same middle name, but yeah, isn't that adorable? Christy said she's procrastinating. Yeah. That's her response. Yeah, probably. <laughs> holiday it is a well-deserved break you have been out yeah. there on tour and and driving like crazy from place to place to oh. share this wonderful story with us and we really appreciate it and I love that both of you showed up in different places and soon in January we will be in the same place together yes, the yes. for <laughs> more than one day We'll be together for like three days. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait. I know. I can't wait either. But again, thank you for everything and for giving us such an amazing, magical story. Thanks, yeah. y'all. Thanks for talking this about it. This is her. such a special book. And thanks for all the good questions, y'all. It makes it so much more fun to talk about. So thank you. <laughs> we'll talk soon. See y'all later. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye, Patty. Bye. See you Wednesday. Patty. Oh, I have you to just sit so. back and about this some more because so many wonderful things came up. I know. Can we do a part two? Well, oh, you know, know what? We didn't, I didn't mention. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our little after show. <laughs> um, I wanted to share, I think, the date of her book club for the Emily Giffen book club. I know it's the 29th, but I'm not sure if it's on Instagram. I will check while we're chatting and figure. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so I saw that out. posted today, share. but I don't recall either. So that yeah. would be to let people know, but I just could sit and listen to Patty all evening. I know, I know. <sighs> and the way that she describes like, I have heard her do the summary of Once Upon a Wardrobe multiple, multiple times. And I can tell you, it never gets old. Every time I hear her tell it, it's like the first time she said it. And I just, this book was so magical and it was, it, it's so perfect for right now, just to start off the holiday season with a little magic and wonder. It's just, Oh, it was so you know, that's so true because it's not exactly, you know, a Christmas book, but there is Christmas in there and it, it yeah. really, wow, it, it, it's, it's going to be an impactful book for a long time. I really uh, just was blown away. So we are so happy to have Patty joining us tonight or ha having joined us tonight to talk about it. Maybe we will get a part two sometime. <laughs> I certainly <laughs> hope so. But in the meantime, I, we have our friends giving. So I'm yes. excited about that on Thursday as well. Everyone make sure if, to go on our page. The event page has a registration link. So it won't be like our book club sessions that are just live at the page. You have to register for friends giving because it'll be a Zoom where we can all see each other like an informal chat format. And we'll be able to see each other. We're going to be sharing recipes, our favorite cookbooks, holiday traditions, just chatting and enjoying each other's company. Um, and you know, we'll we'll probably we'll be talking about books too. <laughs> really? I'm sure they'll come up <laughs> at some point. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that's um, unavoidable. But yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> just make sure you register, and then you'll get an email with the Zoom link for Friendsgiving. Yes, and, and in case you have a difficult time finding it, when you look at the event, you might have to click on see more to get to that link to register, but it's in there. Yeah, so, it's there. And, and then I I'm do excited. also want to confirm Patty's conversation with Emily Giffen is Monday, 
November 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And it's going to be live on the EG Book Club Instagram page. Instagram, so okay. It'll be the Instagram live and it's at EG Book Club. So if you follow that, while we're talking about Instagram, follow me too, Lisa Gets Lit. So I'm going to be doing a pretty cool Friendsgiving giveaway myself next week. So there's that. Yes, absolutely. I might have to <laughs> dust off my Instagram. I think I only created it to, you know, listen to a concert on Instagram one time. So I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to get into the, you know, in, into the whole scene. <laughs> Do not get me excited. I will be excited. Well, you know, you were a star on Instagram this weekend and you didn't even know. Oh, I so did. My daughter. Share. Oh, go Let ahead, me go share ahead. the story. I open up my Instagram. I was at a screening and I was trying to, to get my camera out. My Instagram opened up. And the first thing I see is a picture of Brenda with Mary Alice Monroe. And I went, well, how did this get here? She's on Instagram. And it was Mary Alice Monroe's page. And I was like, oh, I need to take this picture really quick. Um, so after I took my picture, well, it was Josh Brolin. I was at a screening with Josh Brolin. So that was the, the need to take the picture at that moment. It wasn't just me taking a picture at the movie theater. So once I got that done, I opened the Instagram and I sent Brenda a text and I said, did you know that you're on Instagram? And she's like, what? <laughs> it was a beautiful picture of you with Mary Alice Monroe and Angela May. So why don't you tell us about your Y'all Fest experience? This week? Oh my gosh, Y'all Fest was just amazing. For those who don't know what it is, it is a young adult book festival in Charleston and they weren't able to have it last year due to COVID, but it's just the most amazing book festival because so many authors participate. I mean, dozens of authors, um, very popular uh, YA authors, and um, they have panels in different locations every hour and signings all over the place. And it's just, if you ever think that people do not read books anymore, or you kind of despair that it's not as popular as it used to be, go to Y'all Fest because it's, it's just amazing. And so Mary Alice and Angela May were there. They participated in a couple of panels, which were really interesting, but they also signed um, the Islanders. So I was, um, I was there to get, um, well, I shouldn't say whose book it's going to be um, on the show, but <laughs> to get the Islanders inscribed. And uh, Mary Alice ran up and hugged me. And in true Brenda fashion, did I take a photo of us together? <laughs> no. Mary Alice took a photo with her phone and put it on Instagram. Well, your daughter got a good picture of the hug. You just didn't, you couldn't see it was Mary Alice. But it was a beautiful moment. Oh, that's funny. Because that was actually one of the staff from Y'all Fest who did that. Oh. I didn't even, I wasn't I even assumed it was She's good with the picture. <laughs> she was in line for uh, Soman Shanani, the um, the author, and so she wasn't with us. But anyway, it was just hilarious because I've I've got to do better at that. But uh, it was a great event and just wonderful panels, and um, they have a something called Smackdown at the end that's sort of like a a comedy show and all of the authors participate. It's just so much fun. So I would highly recommend it. I, I, I won't go on and on, but that's y'all fest. <laughs> I loved hearing about it and I definitely am going to try to come next year because I, I love that type of environment. Conventions, panels, every type of convention. I just, I love that. And when I was, I was jealous looking, I was jelly looking at your pictures. <laughs> well and I was and I was sending them to you fast and furious from the smackdown so <laughs> but yeah. Angie Thomas is supposed to be one of the hosts for the smackdown next year and she's um she just is really I think she's one of your favorites Lisa yes right? I absolutely love her books and I just I was so excited when I when I that's what I was really jealous of that she was going to be there, but I, I heard that she lives in Atlanta now, so maybe I can hunt her down <laughs> and get an autograph. 
Just no stalking, please. Or if you do, don't mention my name. <laughs> well, she would be fun to have on like a Beyond the Pages, like what we did with, was it Behind the Pages? Behind the Pages. Beyond the Pages. No. Was Beyond? No. No, I don't know. <laughs> we, we don't know. We can see. We're just here. <laughs> we're having a bad. We're having a bad oh, memory night. But anyway, we're live. I think it was behind the pages. Yeah, we did the behind the pages with well, Leslie. Whatever. I think it was behind the pages. It would be fun to do something like that with her. I bet she has so many things to talk about. There's a book that she wrote called On the Come Up about a young woman who is a female rapper. And I was just so, I was so sucked into the story. And I, I think it would be a, a fabulous movie. I mean, her other book, The Hate You Give, turned out to be a fantastic film. So she has those connections. I'd really want to see this one be a movie because in my head, there's an actress that I already know who would be perfect for it. You She's know, that's on the funny. show All American that I watch. I think Kristen Harmel likes that show too, if I'm not mistaken. I did not realize players. it. I did not realize it was a movie. Savannah really, my daughter really liked the book and she bought the collector's edition at Y'all Fest this weekend. So, mm -hmm. um, and it, it looked really cool too, but uh yeah, it's you're gonna have to you're gonna have to investigate that one, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep you guys posted on my Angie Thomas hunt. <laughs> so I think she and Nick Stone are the hosts for next year's SmackDown. I'm not positive about that, but uh, very cool. Anyway, so I think we're um, about wrapping up our yeah. Evening. We've um, taken up enough of. Yes, Thanks we certainly have. For but... Sticking around. Oh, we do have. We have comments. Oh, good. Lots of comments. Still, people are still hanging in with us. So, thank you for that. Please yes. register for Friendsgiving. We definitely want to see you guys. Very much so, and we look forward to seeing you twice next month for two book club picks, and so. And once for happy hour. Yes, celebrating the holidays in a big way. Yeah. Take care, Lisa. Bye. Good night, everyone. Everybody. Good night.